sound? We got sound? The last time when Mike wasn't here and I and Cantina wasn't here and I was worried about sound, I made sure we had sound. I forgot to push the record button. <laughs> had to stay late out of church that night and redo the sermon that morning. Uh, so anyway, <clears throat> would you turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 4? 1 Samuel chapter 4, we're going to use verse number 11 as our starting place. Reach over and grab the person next to you so they can't run. We're going to use 4, 11 as our starting place, but we're preaching on chapter 5, 6, and 7. We've got a long way to go. We're going to do our best to cover it. Came out of revival this week, and by the way, all those that came, we had folks there every night, and of all the ones that came, I want to give you a special thanks. It means a lot to me whenever... Whenever you all will come and, and support me, I, we start again Monday, uh, tomorrow, so be in prayer for us, please. Uh, tomorrow, as we'll be over at Little Flock, but um, uh, really enjoy. But anyway, Friday night, I stood up and said we're preaching from Genesis to Revelation. Got some of them same looks I got just now. <laughs> 1 Samuel chapter 4, would you stand with me as we read our text? 1 Samuel chapter 4, we're going to read verse 11 as our starting place. It said, And the ark of God was taken, and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were slain. Dear Father, we, we bow before you today. We just ask you, God, that you would forgive us, cleanse us, that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit, and God, that you would preach through us your word, that through your word and your Holy Spirit, God, that uh, you would instruct us in righteousness. We give you thanks and we give you praise. In Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, you remember from last week, the people, Israel being the people, began to treat the ark of God as nothing more than a good luck charm. They sent for it. They didn't inquire of God. They sent for the ark and, and took it into battle and, and said the ark will save us. Can I tell you that God could have saved them? But they didn't look to God. They looked merely to the ark. And uh, not only were they defeated, verse 10 there says there was a very great slaughter and there fell 30,000 footmen of Israel. But the ark was taken. It was captured by the Philistines. So as we go forward then in our study through 1 Samuel, we go into chapter 5. It says, And the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it from Ebenezer unto Ashdod. And the Philistines took the ark of God and they brought it into the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon. And when they of Ashdod arose early in the morning, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the earth before the ark of the Lord. And they took Dagon and set him in his place again. And when they arose early on the morrow, morning, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord, and the head of Dagon, and both the palms of his hands were cut off upon the threshold. Only the stump of Dagon was left. Therefore neither the priest of Dagon nor any that come into Dagon's house tread on the threshold of Dagon in Ashdod unto this day. So they take the ark into the house of their god, Dagon, and um, they get up the next morning and, and their little G God, he, he is no God, he, he's fallen over. So they set him back. If you have to set up your God, <laughs> he's not worthy of your worship, is he? Amen. If he can't stand up for himself and you have to set him up. So they set Dagon back up and the next day they come and not only is he fallen, but his head broke off and his hands broke off. He is no God, is he? Verse number 6. But the hand of the Lord was heavy upon them of Ashdod, and he de uh, destroyed them and smote them with emrods, even Ashdod and the coast thereof. So God, uh, his hand was heavy upon them, and he smote them with emrods. Now, what are emrods? We have looked, it has long been debated. Some say emrods. Um, uh, needless to say, they were hideous tumors. They, they may have been cancerous tumors. 
But I want to tell you that as we continue reading here, there's going to be some other signs, some other things that might give us clues as to what it was. And by all appearances, it very well may have been bubonic plague. Suffice it to say, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hand of the living God. That's the point here. God is the one that was in control. The God of Israel. The God of the ark. Not the ark itself, but the God of the ark is the one that was in control. And He could have delivered Israel in the battle if they had only looked to Him. But no, they chose to use only the ark as their source of strength. And it couldn't help them. It was a piece of furniture. It was an important piece of furniture. It was a place where God met them. But still, their focus had left the Jehovah God, the God of Israel, whom they served. Um, if this is bubonic plague, and I'll expound upon that more as we go through this, but if it is bubonic plague, we need to know something about bubonic plague. Bubonic plague swept across England in 1665. It hit London in May of 1665, and in that month, 43 people died. 43. In June, one month later, 6,137 people died. In July, 17,000 36 people died. In August, 31,159 people died. Do you see what I'm talking about? It's a plague. They were buried outside the city in mass graves. It's caused by, listen, it's caused by fleas on rats or any rodents really. But in that case, it was caused by fleas on mice and rats, and they would bite the people and transfer the bubonic plague to people. It's not been stamped out, by the way. Bubonic plague's all over uh, Colorado. Have you seen that in the news lately? Now, I'm not saying people are dropping with it all over, but it's in the rodents. And it has been found in, in a couple of children in Colorado. It was found in California this last week uh, in a, a child that died there. But nevertheless, let's read on. And when the men of Ashdod saw that it was so that uh, they said, The ark of the God of Israel shall not abide with us, for his hand is sore upon us and upon Dagon our God. They sent therefore and gathered all the lords of the Philistines unto them and said, What shall we do with the ark of the God of Israel? And they answered, Let the ark of the God of Israel be carried about unto Gath. And they carried the ark of the God of Israel about thither. And it was so that after they had carried it about, the hand of the Lord was against the, uh, the city with a very great destruction. And he smote the men of the city, both small and great. And they had hemorrhoids in their secret parts. Um, notice the Philistines understood that it wasn't just the ark, it was the God of the ark, the God of Israel. Remember, Israel had forgotten about their God and they just wanted to use the ark as a good luck charm, but the Philistines were well aware that it wasn't just the ark, it was the God of Israel that was causing all of this. And they had emrods in their secret parts. Bubonic plague, I looked it up last night, bubonic plague symptoms include swollen lymph nodes as large as chicken eggs in the groin, armpit, and neck. Also feverish and tender. It's sounding more and more like it might have been bubonic plague, isn't it? Let's read on. Therefore they sent the ark of God to Ekron, and it came to pass as the ark of God came to Ekron, that the Ekronites cried out, saying, they have brought about the ark of the God of Israel to us to slay us and our people. So they sent and gathered together all the lords of the Philistines and said, Send away the ark of the God of Israel and let it go again to his own place, that it slay us not and our people. <clears throat> For there was a deadly destruction throughout all the city. The hand of God was very heavy there. And the men that died... The, oh, that, that died not were smitten with the emeralds, and the cry of the city went up to heaven. Um, looking on into the next chapter. 
And the ark of the Lord was in the country of the Philistines seven months. And the Philistines called for the priest and the diviner, saying, What shall we do to the ark of the Lord? Tell us wherewith we shall send it to his place. And they said, If ye send away the ark of the God of Israel, send it not empty, but in any wise return him a trespass offering. Then you shall be healed, and it shall be known to you why his hand is not removed from you. Then said they, What shall be the trespass offering which we shall return to him? They answered, Five golden emeralds and five golden mice, according to the number of the lords of the Philistines, for one plague was on you all and in your, on your lords. So, uh, he said, we're going to send it back. We need to send a trespass offering. Uh, something to show that we have realized that um, uh, the God of Israel is powerful, that He's really uh, Lord, and we're going to send a trespass offering. Notice what they sent. Five golden emeralds, which are the tumors they had, but also five golden mice, cause and effect. If this is bubonic plague, cause and effect. The mice that was overrunning, that was uh, carrying the fleas, that carried the plague unto the humans. Now, it don't matter. It don't change our discussion whether it's bubonic plague or not. I'm just laying out the evidences of what we can learn from the chapter. And the evidences are that it very well may have been bubonic plague. Now, reading a little more. Wherefore, ye shall make images of your emeralds and images of your mice that mar the land, and ye shall give glory unto the God of Israel. Peradventure he will lighten his hand from off you and from off your gods and from off your land. Wherefore then do ye harden your hearts as the Egyptians and Pharaoh hardened their hearts when he wrought wonderfully among them. Did they not let the people go and they departed? He said we can learn, or they said we can learn lessons from Egypt, can't we? We can see what the Lord God of Israel has done in the past and um, know that he can do that to us as well. So they said, let the evidence speak for itself. Learn the lessons. Boy, that's great advice for us, isn't it? Verse number 7, Now therefore make a new cart and take two milk kine or cows on which there hath come no yoke and tie the kine to the cart and bring their calves home from them and take the ark of the Lord and lay it upon the cart and put the jewels of gold which ye return him for a trespass offering in a coffer by the side thereof and send it away that it may go and see if it goeth up by the way of his coast, of his own coast to Beth Shemesh, then he hath done us this great evil. But if not, then we shall know that it is not his hand that smote us. It was a chance that happened unto us. Or in other words, it was a coincidence. But they said, if these two, they're going to take two milk cows that's never been yoked before. They've never pulled, never been hooked to a wagon or a buggy or anything before. They're going to take two milk cows that have calves, young calves. They're going to harness these um, milk cows to this new cart that they built. They're going to bring their calves home. How many know that if you bring a cow's calf home and pin it up, that cow's going to follow and she's going to stand right on the other side of the fence and bellow? So that's the point here. If the cows do what they should do, what nature says they do, then we know that God didn't have anything to do with this. It was just a coincidence. But if the cows walk away from their calves and don't look back, we know God's hand was upon us. Guess what? Let's read some more. And the men did so, and the two milk kine took two milk kine and tied them to the cart and shut up their calves at home. And they laid the ark of the Lord upon the cart, and the coffer with the mice of gold, and the images of their emeralds. And the kind took the straight way to the way of Bethshemesh, and went along the highway, lowing as they went, and turned not aside to the right hand or to the left. And the lords of the Philistines went after them, 
unto the border of Beth Shemesh. In other words, they went just to see what was going to happen. And they of Beth Shemesh were reaping their wheat harvest in the valley, and they lifted up their eyes and saw the ark and rejoiced to see it. And the cart came into the field of Joshua, a Bethshemite, and stood there <clears throat> where there was a great stone, and they clave the um, wood of the cart and offered the kind as a burnt offering unto the Lord. And the Levites took the ark of the Lord and the coffer that was with it, wherein the jewels of gold were, and put them on the great stone. And the men of Bethshemesh offered burnt offerings and sacrificed sacrifices the same day unto the Lord. And when the five lords of the Philistines had seen it, they returned to Ekron the same day. And these are the golden emeralds which the Philistines returned for a trespass offering unto the Lord. For Ashdod won, for Gaza won, for Eskelon won, for Gath won, for Ekron won. And the golden mice, according to the number of all the cities of the Philistines belonging to the five lords, both of fenced cities and of country villages, even unto the great stone of Abel, whereon they set down the ark of the Lord, which stone remaineth unto this day in the field of Joshua, the Bethshemite. So these milk cows took that cart and pulled it straight away from their calves, straight away from, from the land of the Philistines, straight back to the homeland. And so they knew very well that God's hand not only had been upon them heavy, but God's hand was guiding those cows to walk away from their calves completely against nature. They were lowing, yes, but never looked back. They never wavered to the right hand or to the left hand. The providential hand of God was upon those cows. Now, as we move into chapter 7, I'm going to look down to verse number 3. I've got six, seven minutes. Verse 3 said, And Samuel spake unto all the house of Israel, saying, If ye do return unto the Lord with all your hearts, then put away the strange gods and Ashtaroth from among you and prepare your hearts unto the Lord and serve Him only. And He will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. Then the children of Israel did put away Balaam and Ashtaroth and serve the Lord only. And Samuel said, Gather all Israel to Mizpe, and I will pray for you unto the Lord. And they gathered together to Mizpe and drew water and poured it out before the Lord and fasted on that day, and said there, We have sinned against the Lord. And Samuel judged the children of Israel in Mizpe. And when the Philistines heard that the children of Israel were gathered together to Mizpe, the lords of the Philistines went up against Israel. And when the children of Israel heard it, they were afraid of the Philistines. And the children of Israel said to Samuel, Cease not to cry unto the Lord our God for us, that he will save us out of the hand of the Philistines. And Samuel took a suckling lamb and offered it for a burnt offering holy unto the Lord. And Samuel cried unto the Lord for Israel, and the Lord heard him. And as Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to battle against Israel. But the Lord thundered with a great thunder on that day upon the Philistines and discomfited them, confused them, and uh, they were smitten before Israel. And the men of Israel went out of Mizpeh and pursued the Philistines and smote them until they came to Bethkar. Then Samuel took a stone and set it between Mizpeh and Shin and called the name of it Ebenezer, saying, Hitherto hath the Lord helped us, Ebenezer, stone of help. This stone would be a constant reminder of what God did for them there at Mizpeh. It would be a witness to many generations. Samuel instructed them to return unto the Lord, to put away the strange gods, the little g gods among them, and serve the Lord wholeheartedly. And the Bible said that that's exactly what they did. They put away the strange gods and, and that they serve the Lord only. That's repentance. And that's how we ended last week, if you'll remember. We finally got back to where we ended last week. Repentance. 
We don't hear a whole lot about it, but repentance needs to be preached today. Because the fact is that we need to turn from our sinful ways. We need to turn from our fleshly ways. And we need to put them away. And we need to walk after God, don't we? That's repentance. A change of mind and attitude that results in a change of behavior. And that's what we see there in Israel. They confessed, we have sinned. Um, well, I was going to look back to it. But anyway, they confessed their sin. We have sinned. Confession, we have sinned against the Lord. They're taking personal responsibility, not pointing at somebody else and not blaming. You remember that blame game started in the Garden of Eden, didn't it? When God called man in account for, for disobedience and, and man began to blame his wife and men have been blaming wives ever since, right? Uh, uh, women like that. <laughs> women have been blaming somebody too. He blamed serpent, didn't she? You see, they took personal responsibility. We have sinned. We need to get back to taking personal responsibility for our own actions and for our sins. And then Samuel poured out water. That symbolized a repentant heart poured out in submission and personal trust before God. Look at um, Psalm 62 right quick. Psalm 62 and verse number 8. Trust in Him at all times, ye people. Pour out your heart before Him. God is a refuge for us. So we're to pour out our, like that water was poured out before the Lord, symbolizing repentance and um, pouring out our heart in submission to the Lord. So they repented and they followed the Lord and served the Lord wholeheartedly. Then the Philistines heard that they had gathered to Mizpeh. And the Philistines said, well, we'll just go down and defeat them again. We'll just go down there and attack can I tell you that you have an enemy? We have an enemy that's always on the lookout for opportunities to attack. That's why Peter said, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. And then he said, Whom uh, resist steadfast in the faith? How do we resist? By being strong enough? No! Resist steadfast in the faith. We resist in the faith, in the help of the Lord, in the faith of Jesus Christ, in the faith of the Lord whom we serve. You see, this time I told you before that God could have saved them before from the Philistines, but they didn't cry out to God. They brought the ark in and said, the ark will save us. The ark was a piece of furniture. It was not to be treated like a good luck charm. God was the one to be trusted in, not the ark. And so they didn't cry out to God. This time, what did they do? They cried out to God. Um, go back to Psalm. Psalm 121. Psalm 121. I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord which made heaven and earth. They received a mighty deliverance. As Samuel took a suckling lamb and he offered it as an offering unto the Lord and he began to pray and he cried out to the Lord and God heard the cry of Samuel and the Lord thundered with a great thunder. And the Bible says, King James says, discomfited. You know, this is not the only time that God used a thunderstorm to defeat an enemy. In Judges chapter 5, you, you, you find the song of Deborah and she's uh, giving God praise for what He had done and, and what you learn is that God used a thunderstorm in that case to defeat the enemy as well. See, they had chariots of iron. In that case, they had chariots of iron and they got stuck in the mud. <laughs> Here we're simply told that God thundered with a great thunder and discomfited or confused the enemy. We don't know all that happened there, but the fact is that Listen, the God who quiet storms, and somebody sang about that a little bit ago about uh, you know God can, can quiet in the storm and all of that. The same God that can quiet in the storm, He can also create the storm to defend His people. And He has and He will. So there was confusion in the Philistine army. And then, and then Samuel set up a, a great victory was had in Samuel, verse number 12 took a stone and set it between Mizpeh and Shin and called the name of it Ebenezer, saying, 
Hitherto hath the Lord helped us. A stone of help. It was literally a stone of remembrance. A memorial, a stone of remembrance of God's help. You know, I, I think there ought to be some memorials in our life. There ought to be some stones in our life that we erect that are too great to be forgotten. Your salvation experience. And by the way, if you're saved, you have a salvation experience. At some point, you first got saved. At some point was when you first placed your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ, if you're saved. I know we have to have faith in Him every day. I know we, knew, we renew our faith every morning. I understand that. But at some point, that was the first time. It ought to be a stone. Okay? I understand. Listen, old timers happens. Other things happen. Car crashes. Things that affect... I understand that. And God does too. And so I'm not telling you that if you don't have every memory clear, then you're not saying, wait what I'm saying. You can still know today, even if you don't have that memory, you can still know today that you trust in Jesus, can't you? But if you have a healthy mind, you ought to be able to know when you first became a believer. But that's not all. Answered prayer. I mean, when there was no other way except God supernaturally stepped in and intervened and delivered you, there ought to be a stone too great to be forgotten in your life that you can look back on and remember and give God glory and give God praise and give God thanks for who He is and for what He's done. His protection. Great times of need where God supernaturally stepped in and met that need. You know, if we would focus more on God, on who He is, on what He has done and what He's still able to do, we would spend less time worrying and fretting and being discouraged. If we spend more time looking at God instead of the circumstances, we spend less time walking in defeat. God is... I know you've heard me say it before. It's one of my favorite sayings. Aware, available, and able. He's always aware, available, and able. We need to remember that. Things in our life is too great to be forgotten. And I could enumerate for the rest of the day when God has intervened in my life. Things that are too great to be forgotten that I can look back on and draw strength and encouragement from. But it's a reminder of what God did yesterday. He's well able to do today. He's still able to take care of you today. And He's still able to take care of you tomorrow. Ebenezer, a stone of help. Israel's help came from God. It didn't come from the ark. It came from their God. The God of Israel. The God of the ark. Your help and mine also comes from God. Not some good luck charm that we may you know, rub on or, or what? Our help comes from God. And we need to remember that. And we need to call out to Him in times of need. And when He, de and when he delivers, we need to give Him praise. And we need to give Him thanks. And we need to set a stone. And Ebenezer, we need to set a stone of help, a stone, of, um, a memorial to remind us how good God is. Has God been good in your life? Amen. Has God been good to you this last week? God been good to me last week. Won't you focus on Him? Rather than focus on all the problems and all the troubles and all the aches and all the pains, won't you focus on God? I told him Friday night I ran into an old acquaintance and, and, I, and it was actually in church. I was preaching revival when I, anyway and I, and I said, how you doing? I hadn't seen you. How you, how you been? And he said, oh, it ain't good. I ain't been, I just been, I got this true, I got this true, I got something. He told me, I said, I'm sorry. I hope it gets better. I'll pray for you. He said, how you doing? I'm great. I'm great because God's great. He's mine. I'm His. I'm a child of God. He's wonderful. <laughs> he said, boy, ain't nothing wrong with you. Well, I got problems. I'm great. I saw him the next night. I said, how, how you doing? Is it any better? He says, it's a little worse. It's a little worse. I'm sorry. I hope it gets better. I'll pray for you. He said, how are you? I'm great. 
Because God's great and I'm His child. He's mine and I'm His. We can have that attitude, you know. That don't mean nothing's wrong. It means I'm great anyway. Because God's great. Let's stand. Dear Father, we thank You for Your Word. We thank You for Your Holy Spirit. We ask You today, minister God. Minister to hearts. Draw us all closer to You. Father, uplift and encourage. Draw unto salvation. Anyone that hears these words and, and is without Jesus Christ, draw them unto salvation. We ask God for your honor, for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you turn it over to the Lord? Whatever it is. Every one of us need him every hour. Will you turn it over to him? You need that battle you're facing? Will you turn it over to the Lord? surely do.